you all for taking some time out of your Wednesday afternoon to attend this event. It's our second speaker event of the year and we continue to be overwhelmed just by the support everyone's shown the PP Society so far this year. Um, I shall not take up too much of your time here other than to warmly um, welcome and introduce our speaker for the day, Dr. John Barry. Dr. Barry is heavily involved in both local politics and academia here in Northern Ireland. He is a councillor and former co-chair of the Green Party and I. He is a reader in the School of Politics, International Studies and Philosophy at Queen's University Belfast, as well as the director of the Centre for Sustainability and Environmental Governance and the associate director of the Institute for Sustainable Work. Um, Dr. Barry also recently authored the book, a book entitled The Politics of Actually Existing on Sustainability, Human Flourishing in a Climate Changed Carbon Constrained World, published by Oxford University Press which this presentation is in part based upon, I believe. His talk today, entitled Economics as Myth, Economics as Power, Why Modern Economics has Failed and How to Fix It, will analyze the dominance and prevalence of one school of thought <coughs> in economics, the discourse that is neoliberal economics. Dr. Bai will investigate what he describes as the ideological and mythic characters of modern economics, challenging us to rethink this account and question its premises. Are there not alternative political economies worth including in our discussions? It will be discussed. So without further ado, I'd like you all to welcome Dr. Barry and enjoy. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank, thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm a small man with a big head and many jobs, as you can see. I've come fresh from the fight against the forces of darkness and North Down Councilors Jim at the back of the test. Otherwise known as the DUP. This <laughs> <laughs> thing is on. Is it? Okay. So what I'm giving you um, is largely my academic work, but it is informed by my political in involvement in seeing the devastation that um, one particular model of economic understanding or what the economy is has wrought on society. Um, and Andrew, in his last uh, presentation to you, kind of outlined some of the technical or internal contradictions of this neoliberal um, or neoclassical model gone, gone crazy in terms of economics. And um, what I'm interested in here today is deconstructing that. And it's a pity there's not more uh, colleagues from the School of Management here, because part of the argument I'll be making is that right across the UK and Ireland and, and more generally, we no longer have departments of economics, but the departments of management. And that's part of the argument I'm making, is that we almost have full spectrum domination of one particular view of the economy, namely the neoliberal or neoclassical one. And if you like the weaker element of my argument, it is late on a, on a Wednesday, and if you do drop off, and don't worry, I won't take it badly, the take-home message from today, or the weak element, is an argument for pluralism. Pluralism. Who here, doing PPE or doing economics, has been exposed to feminist economics, Marxist economics, healthy doses of Keynesian, economics, rather than microeconomics as it's understood, or a particular version of, of macroeconomics. So that's the argument I make. It's a weak argument for pluralism, but I'm also going to be presenting a stronger argument for at least a strong consideration of a green political economy perspective uh, for a variety of reasons which I'll outline. The background, as already mentioned, is based on this book I just got published with Oxford University Press. Um, and the real issue here is the, is the, is the subtitle. The issue of human flourishing, which tends to drop off our public policy debate. In fact, for those who were at the previous discussion, uh, by Graham Parks here from Cork, talking about the issue of human flourishing within the context of, of climate change and so on. How do we actually bring human flourishing back into our discussions of essentially uh, a return to the roots of economics and political economy? Adam Smith was not a right-wing wingnut who bequeathed his name to a neoliberal ideological outfit of that name that operates in London. The Adam Smith of the Wealth of Nations is a book of political economy, understanding the importance of ethics, morality, and politics, state power in organization of the economy. But previous to that, and the basis of the Wealth of Nations is Smith's idea of the theory of moral sentiments. Smith was an, a, an, an integral part of the Scottish Enlightenment in the 18th century. So in other words, what I'm arguing for is the re-embedding of our economic understanding in politics, in ethics, in values, as opposed <coughs> to seeing it as a narrow technical 
issue about how we organize the macro economy. This is a phrase I borrow from our brothers and sisters and compatriots down south. This is a phrase doing the rounds in public debate in the Republic of Ireland. We are where we are. And this is the context in terms of the global financial crash. Um, the mo wrong model here where finance is at the heart of our economic understanding up until um, uh, the crash. It still is there. And we're talking about the issue of zombie economics. How come these dead ideas are still around? Issue obviously of uh, we need to go on a carbon and other sorts of diets, uh, including myself. And this rather provocative image here is the issue of our utter dependence as a society on oil and the geopolitics of that, whether it's in resource wars or in the phrase that I read on an anti war demonstration in 2003 against the war in Iraq elect an oil president, get an oil war. Another good phrase from that campaign was also drop spuds, not scuds. <laughs> but this is the issue. Our dependence on oil means we're going to have these engagements uh, where we have the unforced situation. As a cartoon at the time said, what's my oil doing under your sand? My oil under your sand. And that issue of the geopolitics of resource and energy dependence. Come on, I'm just killing the time you got here. Um, and I begin with this rather anodyne statement. You may hear uh, various commentators in, in the news, you know, whether it's Mike Smith of Ulster University, or John Simpson, or Jamie Delarney, to name but a few. Um, and they're asked to comment about the economy, not because <coughs> what they say is true, but because they're asked. It's an important point to make is that, yes, there are certainly technical issues of expert knowledge you need in any understanding of any aspect of the world and indeed in the human economy, but actually some of the major parameters of understanding an economy aren't that difficult to get, grab a hold of. And indeed part of my interest academically is to debunk the myth of economics as some sort of so specialist an understanding of human knowledge that only an elite priesthood and you can see now I'm getting into kind of mythological aspects. It is almost like a priesthood. And the way in which our politicians, most of whom are ecologically and economically illiterate at the best of times, they're very good at history. As I was saying to <coughs> somebody earlier on, in Northern Ireland, our political situation is that we walk into the future looking backwards, 1916, 17, whatever, that our political discourse really isn't uh, either scientifically, ecologically, or economically um, literate in terms of understanding the issue that face Northern Ireland and this islands, uh, these islands as a whole in the 21st century. And I begin from the supposition, the argument, and I think there's a lot of evidence to back this up, that we have, as I said earlier, full spectrum domination, both in the academy and your heads, full of essentially a neoliberal understanding of the economy. You ask a man or woman on the street, their understanding of the economy, and more or less you'll get a version of a neoliberal perspective. And again, you might get a, an old Marxist who still keeps the faith, but more or less, the last 30 years, we've had in our public discourse, our intellectual discussions, certainly our, 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 our political discourse, is the domination of one model. Certainly since the end of communism, or at least the fall of the wall in 1989, capitalism has won. So therefore that means all debates are, are off. And there's a variety of ways you can understand neoliberalism as a form of understanding the economy. Uh, a dominant meta-narrative, a regime of truth, uh, a planetary vulgate, um, or paranoia, as well as you do Foucault, are interested in the way in which language and ideas do have power. How we construct and perceive the world is also about constructing a particular world. And certainly with economics, economics, in my view, does not just naively or neutrally describe the world, it prescribes how the world ought to be. The distinction being, a, a description is of how the world is. You see, to describe it, that's how it is. But what I'm saying is that economics does not do that, and the reason why it doesn't do that is because of its value commitments, which I'll talk about in a moment. Economics, any form of economics, is ideological, and therefore it's prescribing how the world ought to be. So it's not describing neutrally or impartially how the world is, the facts. <coughs> it's actually prescribing, telling us how the world ought to be, values. 
Now, I've got no difficulty with that, except economists and the economics profession, the mainstream economics profession, prefers not to talk about the value commitments that they have. They smuggle them in. Who is this strange creature, homo economicus? Who are these abstract, atomized individuals that go around maximizing the utility? Now, these are the basic building blocks of our economic perspective. These are suffused with values, individualistic, possessive, accumulative, consumptive, and they serve a particular interest. So my argument here is that every form of understanding the economy, the green one I'll even present towards the end, is ideological. It's making value commitments about how the world ought to be. And that's how economics was in the beginning. Whether it's uh, economia in Aristotle, or indeed, as I mentioned, in terms of Smith and the, the birth of modern economics and so on, they were very clear. This was a political economy. They were making very clear their value assumptions, saying the market system is the best one we can have for these variety of reasons. They didn't assume the market was natural, that it somehow um, came out of the sky like the rain. It was a thoroughly human creation, socially constructed, and therefore could be socially reconstructed. Whereas we have a sense now of the economy, the computer says now, no, we can do about it. It's like the force, it's like the weather. As if there's nothing we can do to change how we understand the economy. <coughs> and the reason why economics is perhaps the most powerful ideology that we have today is on the one hand, people don't see it as ideological. It's just a science. I mean, uh, you know, e economists like to think of themselves as being members of the queen of the social sciences. They're hard. They have econometrics and they have statistics and so on. They are suffering from physics envy, <laughs> with all the Freudian implications of that. <laughs> and they smuggle in their values under the assumption of it being science and neutral and so on. But the other reason why economics is so powerful is this, well, you know, uh, Jonathan Aldred, and he has a book called The Skeptical Economist. He talks about his veto power. How many times have you heard in our public debate, and indeed it's amazing how statisticized and quantified, quantified our public discourse has become. I put it to you that real rate of growth will go up by 3%. What's that mean? That sounds really tough and authoritative. It's a very male way. If I have more time, I'll talk about the male stream implications of this. There's a very interesting gender dynamic going on and how the economy is understood here. And this veto economics, that's only economic. You know, we haven't got the money. You know, and there is, don't get me wrong, there are elements of truth in this. You have a budget, that's the amount of money you have, and therefore you can only do a certain amount of things. I mean, economics is a discourse of limits and scarcity, which we'll talk about in a moment, how often that's politically and artificially created. But this is the power of economics. Just to say that it's uneconomic is enough to cut dead an argument. That you're so naive that you think, merely being idealistic, that your arguments will carry the day when you have to come up against the brute power of this force of nature. And that's the point I'm making, is that economics has been understood as like a force of nature. It's beyond human control, except for these mystical priesthoods, these, uh, this elite that really understands the details, the technical details of how can we get to full male employment or wherever it is. And part of my concern as an academic in the university is that, you can read there, I've just taken this example from uh, a very eminent uh, historian, uh, Bauer, talking about the, the lack of, in this case, historical awareness. But I think this idea of technically competent barbarians is precisely what contemporary economics, mainstream economics teaching, and most of the universities does. People come out very technically competent and understanding, I don't know whether you're still doing this, ISLM curves and microeconomics and preference satisfaction and so on, all looks very impressive. And indeed, I'm, I'm actually more comfortable with describing that quantitative mathematical element of um, economics as a form of poetry. There's something quite beautiful about seeing these diagrams, but don't tell me it's telling me anything meaningful about the real world. It's a form of poetry or myth. Again, there's that connection. And it's a very compelling myth because it delivers the goodies. Not something that I go on to uh, in a moment. But I, I do fear that this <coughs> lack of fulsome awareness of the ideological value commitments of economics means that people who are not 
necessarily, their own values may not be capitalist. And it's amazing how that word isn't even used in most economics textbooks. It's a form of capitalist economics, but no one talks about it. It's the market. Uh, because the assumption is that, well, there's only a, a capitalist market that we have in existence that's going to be able to deliver and uh, create an economy in conformity with market principles. Before I move on, I'm just going to also say, and I've already mentioned it, just to make it clear that not only does modern teaching of economics at universities and in secondary level not reveal or not the, uh, make as explicit the value commitments of economics, but there's no sense of the history of the discipline. How many of you know the history of economics stretching back into moral theology, its roots in Christianity, where for hundreds of years in Europe, you could not allow bread or beer or wine or other essentials to be allowed to be at the vagaries of the market. There was a certain just price. And that was seen as part of economics. What do you mean to the market and producers and consumers? No, that's the price. In a, in a society such as we are, you must not pay more than how many other shekels or pence or whatever it is for a pint of beer. And human history is full of the ways in which we understand the organisation of the economy as an expression of that society's values. And yet most students have no sense of the history of economics. They just get presented with a fait accompli. Here's the market principles, supply and demand, efficiency, and here's some nice econometric diagrams. It's going to hurt your head, but you need to do it. No sense of the history, no sense of the values. So this is what I mean by this idea of producing technically competent barbarians. And indeed, what's interesting about this particular form of ideology, again, I'm talking about economics now as an ideological commitment, and of course, that's the most powerful form of ideology, is one that doesn't pretend it's an ideology. The null set is still a set. The denial of ideological values does not mean that they're not there. It just means that you're not coming clean about them. There's a, a sleight of hand going on when I'm playing in economics. And indeed, this ideology doesn't need to speak. I mean, I'll tell you a story. A very eminent... Uh, Economist, he's, a, he's like me, he's a dissident economist. I know that term is oh, dissident, what's that in this society? <laughs> but he's a heterodox economist called Tim Jackson uh, that we talked about in, in Graham's uh, discussion. He's written a wonderful book called Prosperity Without Growth, which I'll talk about in a moment. He came here three years ago, and uh, Geo 6 or 7, the big lecture theatres here, full of civil servants, uh, advisors to ministers, political parties, academics, and then people like me who just kind of let in to make up the numbers. And Tim's argument is essentially like mine that the economic growth model as we now know it has come to an end. We need to find a new way of organizing the economy for ecological and also for human flourishing reasons, and also to address issues of inequality. And what was interesting is all the majority of the people in that room, A, there were men in suits, civil servants or politicians, and they preside over the operation of the economic system in Northern Ireland. Those private sector people there, institute directors and so on. What was interesting is there's people like me, and others who more or less agreed with Tim, but of course the typical academic affliction is that I agree with you 99%, but the 1% we disagree with. That's what we pick up on. So the debate afterwards was between largely people who shared similar values to uh, the speaker, Tim Jackson in this case, and the vast majority of those who should have been absolutely offended by what he had to say, because he was directly criticising all these ministers, ministerial advisors, political parties, you know, uh, lobby groups for industry and so on. He was saying, much as I am here today, that the economic model that they have and the worldview that they have is fundamentally flawed. They said nothing. Silence. And I was speaking to Tim afterwards, and then we, I, I said, you know what I've just discovered? Power doesn't need to speak. Why would power bother to expose itself to vulnerability in questioning or engaging in a debate? It just, it has the power. And this is quite a common feature in many parts of politics, that power doesn't have to speak. That's a particularly interesting uh, example for me, but I think this is more generally in terms of the way in which modern economics um, works. Particularly in terms of, you know, from, because it is attached to a certain understanding of political liberalism, which works on the assumption, silence equals contentment. If you're not out in the streets like French farmers throwing dead sheep at your minister, 
which they tend to do with the CAP policy has changed, things are okay. So silence equals truth in terms of the regime. So the issue is, and this is how the economic system, as I understand it, works. The compact is, we'll deliver economic growth. You sit there, be passive and consume, be docile and disciplined. That's the deal. So in other words, we've sold our heritage for a, was it a soup of pottage or a pottage of soup. We become consumers, not citizens, as part of the, the, the compact that we have under neoliberalism. <coughs> and I use an intellectual an interpretation of this, uh, of the theorist that perhaps you're not familiar with. This is Theodore Adorno, one of the great uh, humanist Marxists of the 20th century. Um, he and uh, Max Horkheimer wrote The Dialect of Enlightenment, one of the best critiques of the Enlightenment. We just read there, um, the issue is again this silence in our consumer capitalist societies. In fact, it has a particular resonance, I think, which I may have time to get into. Uh, it's about loyalty. Loyalism, no loyalty. Loyalty to the system is garnered through these uh, passive acts of consumption and buying into the system. I'm being quiet, accepting it. In other words, you don't need to express explicit consent, except it's a bit like, you know, uh, uh, implicit consent you get in theorists like Locke and Hobbes, where you did the dead white men course of political theory. And in some respects, I think there are ways in which you can describe this particular understanding of the world where nobody is claiming, hold on, the emperor has no clothes. Because there's a form of groupthink. And this was particularly prevalent in economics in the run-up to the global financial crisis in 2008, where all of this panoply of mathematical ideas, of the efficient market hypothesis, of trickle-down economics and so on, just did not either predict the crisis, there's a few notable <coughs> uh, exceptions, now, surely if you're a science, you can predict. That's one of the elements of a science. You can predict when things are going to happen. You have models and law-like generalizations. Economics didn't predict the crash. In fact, they were fielding the fire in terms of the irrational exuberance. And you can see, and I think Andrew has some slides. I don't know whether he showed them last time or not, but these very arcane, again, rather beautiful algorithms that were worked out for credit default swaps and, and so on. And it just looks so solid, because it has maths behind it. But never be taken in by simply statistics. Because here's a nice phrase around statistics. She uses statistics like a drunk uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination. She uses statistics like a drunk uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination. If I was to give you one suggestion, if you want to be an active citizen in our contemporary democracy, understand some basic statistics to be able to deconstruct them. Because a lot of people feel disempowered when election time comes on or when you hear debates on the television where it's all this mathematics or statistics being bandied about. It disempowers people and they say, well, I don't know nothing about that because it's, well, that sounds above me. A lot of it's bullshit. It's because we have you know, lost any rudimentary sense of understanding basic statistics often that you, uh, people feel this sense of disempowerment, which feeds then this sense of uh, economics of an arcane elitist idea. <coughs> and what's interesting for me, both as a you know, public intellectual is probably too much, but certainly low down the food chain politically, just listening to the public debate, we don't get these robust debates between socialism and Capitalism, we did in the 70s and 60s. You know, what does New Labour stand for in Britain? Well, Tony Blair MP was an anagram of I am Tory Plan B. <laughs> it says it all. You know, really, what's the, where's the big battle of ideas around our direction of our society? And the silence, I think, and particularly around the economics, there isn't a really robust debate, which reduces then economics. Oh, I'm not an economist. And therefore, I don't feel competent to argue. What I'm saying is, if economics is understood as political economy, any competent citizen can make comments and have warranted judgments about how the economy ought to be organized. It isn't this arcane. Yes, specific policies. Definitely you need you know, technical expertise. But larger issues, 
of what the economy is for, what sort of society that we want, in which the economy is a means to an end, not an end to itself. That's part of it, the problem we, we face is that the economy now has become an end in itself. The economy is a means to an end. Last time I looked, we lived in societies with economies. We don't live in economies that has a bit of a society at the side. Again, this issue of re-embedding the economy back in society and hopefully back in within uh, democratic politics, rather than seeing as somehow we've outsourced the organisation of the economy to a, a specialist group and discipline. As I already mentioned, we, all, we have this sense of um, a lot of schools and universities now don't have the title of economics. The management is almost like, well, the economics debate is over. We're just managing the neoliberal capitalist economy. And yes, there are technical issues to be worked out, but more or less, the big debates are over. Now move on, get with the program, almost. In a similar way, you could say the writing on the wall for me about universities was when the Department of Education became the Department of Employment and Skills in the UK. As if now education is purely in the service of the market and the economy. Again, all these ideological, linguistic, but policy shifts which signal a certain view of economics and the way society should be organised. And some of the myths that modern economics has, it naturalises the economy as if it's a force of nature. The computer says, no, that's just the way it is. As if it somehow escaped human control, like the rain. And what I mean by fetishising the market is that that is seen as the preeminent coordinating institution to organise a, a complex, globalised 21st century society and economy. And what I'm saying is, again, the weaker element of my argument is where is the debate in the academy, in our public uh, intellectual discourse? in our politics around the organisation of the economy. And I think particularly when it comes to naturalising the, uh, the economy, as if it's a, beyond human control, I mean, that's a form of mythical thinking, as well as ideological, making us think that the economy cannot be brought under human control. And almost makes the claim, or at least it's structurally similar, it's almost godlike. It's an act of God. The global economic crisis maybe was a partly like an act of God as opposed to the, the mundane operation and structural weaknesses of a particular economic system. And particularly this discourse, I mean, a lot of this is taken from um, the, the debate around austerity, in particular down south, and the bond markets and, the, and these mythical bondholders, these kind of godlike, fearful creatures that we have to appease. In order to get a line of credit so we can pay our um, you know, DLA to the next person. And to me, there's a, there's a similarity, and it's, a bit, or it's an interesting way of looking at this. This is like the operation of a priesthood, in terms of what, what, what would the markets bear, as if, are the gods happy? Let's give them a sacrifice. Well, in our case, the sacrifice is austerity, in the hope that this failed economic system will <coughs> Lazarus like arise. And we'll be back to 2008 again. Let's go back on the consumption bandwagon. I mean, that's the dominant discourse out there in society, in the public sector, in the trade unions that I've even come across, certainly in the political class, is how to get us back to where we were before uh, the crash. And I think I'm interested in, in narratives and uh, the cultural dimension of this. There is a symbolism of the Chancellor coming up with his red suitcase. I mean, these are all rites, rituals. Now, how different is that than any appropriation right you can find in anthropological studies of supposedly pre-modern peoples, where they sacrificed their young in the volcano so the gods would make it rain, so the crops would grow? How, how different? And what I'm trying to get at is quite a provocative thought, haven't been provocative enough already, that we think because we live in a 21st century society, with iPhones and apps and all the rest of it, that somehow we, we've escaped myths. We're scientific, we're rational. Crap. Crap. We are as equally open, receptive, desirous of myths and narratives of any <coughs> other uh, phase of human development and evolution. The power of this one is that we've fallen for it because it has the sheen of being rational calculating, mathematical, objective, clinical, 
and so on. If I'm presenting a provocative idea that actually this is a myth, it's a form of mythological thinking, aspects of it are quite magical, magical wishing, oh yes, if we just cut the public sector, we get back, the gods will be happy, the bond markets will release their goodies, and we'll all be back to where we were. I mean, this is the same thinking that has pervaded human society ever since we dropped out of the trees in the African savannah. Of things that are beyond our control, how do we create a relationship with the gods or the, uh, the entity that's going to give us the things that we want? I mean, all I'm saying to you is that this is the same kind of logic and thinking that's going on. And my big argument from a green perspective is that the myth our societies live by, this is Tim Jackson, is the myth of economic growth. It is the dominant myth in our economic thinking and in our public policy discourse. And again, for me, this reveals well, it's calculus, the barren wisdom of the, of the mystical. Of course, no one would dare suggest it and tell it what it is. You have to pretend that it's rational, the state is in its bureaucratic wisdom, it knows what it's doing. There's also that myth of the state actually knowing what it's doing. If you actually meet some politicians or decision makers, they will tell you a different story of what goes on behind the, 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 the veneer of the state being in control. Often it's chaos. Departments fighting against each other, individuals carrying out personal vendettas. They're not knowing. I mean, the panic and fear that was up in the, up in the storm and, and in other centres of government when the financial crash happened, particularly our own wee little government here, who sadly bet on the idea of property prices rising so this is the economic model, in case you didn't know, for Northern Ireland. That the executive, the dupers and the shinners got <coughs> together, property prices are rising, we'll sell off lots of public assets, particularly army bases, for housing development, which is doing very well, that'll bring in lots of money, and we won't have to raise taxes. Oh my God, introduce water charges, the one revenue raising option they had. And that worked out very well, in the sense of the property crash. There was also the largely tragic comic uh, example that just at the time of the crisis really hitting, we had a large investment conference here in Belfast at the cost, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of pounds, we had all these American uh, companies over um, in terms of picking the financial sector. Again, another uh, section of the economy that has shown itself not to be this mythical pot of endless money like a cornucopia. So the model of the economy that we had here was financialization and selling off public land, both of which are now gone. Has the executive changed its views on how the economy can be revived? No, it's still trapped in a similar a traditional model that the economic nostrums tell us, foreign direct investment. On the words of Basil McRae, at least an honest, autonomous politician, we have to compete with China who are on low wages, so that means we have to become a low wage economy. This is the barren wisdom of the mythical, a race to the bottom. So there's been no great leap in thinking or imagination as a result of the crisis within the executive. Hence, there's a wonderful book by an Australian economist, John Quiggan, Zombie Economics. Because most of the, the dominant ideas in, in economics, particularly the efficient market hypothesis and stochastic equilibrium and the, the rather you know, bizarre but elegant and beautiful you know, uh, mathematical formulae for credit default swaps and all the rest of it, all failed. But yet these dead ideas still live amongst us. How can these ideas, which have been discredited as a result of the economic crisis, still be alive? And I, part of my interest in this is how can these ideas you know, be alive? And I, I reached the idea that they're mythical, they're ideological, they're embedded in all sorts of complicated ways in our public policy, decision making, even in our own heads. Certainly amongst our decision making class, this model has achieved, as I mentioned before, full spectrum domination. It's crowded out any other form of understanding the, the economy. Some of the dangers of this mythical thinking, this is part of a campaign called the Toxic Textbooks Campaign, and I should uh, declare people have been uh, um, recorded 
The campaign was to get students in universities to download this and put them on the stickers and go around to the libraries to orthodox economics textbooks and stick these warning signs on them. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm not telling you to do that. Okay. But that was the idea behind them. Just like you have you know, uh, warning stickers on, on, on cigarettes. So warning stickers on most orthodox economic textbooks because if you read them, and it's funny, I think if you have any sense of the biophysical laws of the world, or the world that we live in, most orthodox economics textbooks have consumers and producers. So, but, but where's nature? Where's, where's energy? Where did the pollution go? It's an absolutely bizarre, disembedded conception of the human economy. The human economy is a subset of the larger ecosystem. Yet, maybe there's a chapter towards the end of the book, particularly in the last 20 years as economics textbooks, largely produced by American uh, academics, have actually had a book we have to recognise ecological issues. So there's one bit, usually at the end of the book, yeah, we talk about pollution or climate change or something. But by and large, producers, consumers, supply and demand, jobs are good. It's all about price. Rather than actually saying, yeah, that's part of it, but where does the stuff come from? To get the factory going, the pollution that's created as a result of it, how does that get disposed? How are wages set and so on? Issues of power are elided uh, from this particular picture as well. Another, the other danger of an economic growth myth is this, is that if we understand the human economy as a subset of the larger ecosystem, well, with the exception of solar radiation, uh, there are limits to the planet's ability to provide resource and absorb pollution. These are non-negotiable. Mama nature doesn't do bailouts. So, how can, logically, a smaller system that's part of a bigger system grow within the confines of the limits of the planet? It's just biophysically impossible. That's what the ecological element of the limits to growth is. It's just simply making the point that there's only so much oil, there's only so much capacity of the planet to absorb CO2 <coughs> before we fry the planet. So therefore, at some point, we need some negative feedback mechanisms from a system's point of view to actually get the human economy in balance or sustainability within the larger ecosystem. I'm going to skip over the stuff about uh, economics and uh, the financialization. Except for this, I mean, I do think, again, to develop this idea of the mythological nature of contemporary economics. I mean, for those who studied medieval history, uh, there's a concept of alchemy. A lot of very eminent scientists and so on and, and other more <coughs> dubious persons try to create dross, base metals into gold. It's a combination of magic and science. It's kind of an interesting example of that cusp between a pre-modern and modern worldview. Well, how different was that attempt by the alchemists of old to turn dross into gold than this amazing feat to turn death, which was kind of bad, you know, you're in debt, becomes an asset. And as Andrew described in his last talk, he kind of salami sliced this, packaged them up, and there you go. I mean, it's an amazing feat. That debt becomes an asset that you sell on, and so on. And a lot of the financial problems that we're now in is as a result of this, what I would call mythical, alchemic type of thinking. Just to finish up then, if we can uh, have a conversation, I do think we have to start thinking in the West, in the minority world, there's 800 million of us that live at the top of the global food chain. You know, even within those 800 million, which I mean Europe, North America, Australasia, and the elites of most countries of the world, the middle classes, the ones who are you know, consuming quite a lot, flying around the world, watching soaps and all the rest of it, that's 800 million. There are 7 billion of us on the planet. So that leaves 6.2 billion other people who aren't part of this party. They're the people who don't have shoes on their feet, don't have potable water, don't have universal access to free medical health care or any me medical health care. And the reasons why, although I'm a great believer in the internet and its connectivity and the liberating dimensions of, of the internet, most people in the world do not have Twitter or Facebook or a mobile phone or access to the internet. And just because we live in this kind of infoscape or technoscape, we shouldn't make the mistake of saying that every in the world is living like that. So when I'm questioning economic growth, it is for the minority world, us, largely white, 
Western or European in origin, but also including the elites of many of the developing world countries. But to question economic growth, and I speak now partly as an academic and as a politician, to question economic growth, you're just seen as mad. How could you question economic growth? Everybody's for economic How, in the midst of a global ecological crisis, we're all crying out for economic growth, could you even begin to question that idea? And my view is that the science is telling us we have to. And as I mentioned in the last class that we had with Graham, I would like to see an economy designed by a scientist, or at least that has some reference to the basic laws of the universe and biophysical realities. Bring science into designing. I would imagine most scientists, and I've spoken to quite a few of them, they would not design a system that's based on perpetual growth. It's simply impossible. The issue is identifying what's the threshold beyond which your economic growth becomes uneconomic growth. It's actually making things worse rather than better. Because to put it very bluntly, growth for its own sake is the ideology of the cancer cell. That's what cancer is. It's cells that are healthy up to a point and then they go out of control when they transgress the threshold. We are now in the West, in the minority world, in the cancerous stage of growth. What we need in our society is actually more redistribution. We have a lot of wealth in our society. You know, there are people in the village that probably go to bed hungry, or although it's not, not as cold as it usually is this time of year, our pensioners having to worry about whether they have food or fuel. And we live in a very rich society. But of course the solution is seen as growth. If more growth than it trickle down, well the planet cannot take that level of more economic growth. What's more ecologically rational is to redistribute the available resources we have to meet the needs of the people that we have in our society. This also has the added benefit of reducing socio-economic inequality, which itself is a major cause of many of the problems in our society. And also, in my view, the statistics and some of the surveys tend to, on the evidence tends to point this way, would actually increase human happiness and flourishing, lowering socio-economic inequality itself, but a lot of positive benefits. So the issue is, how do we actually begin to envisage uh, and economics beyond the economic growth. And here's a good example of how not to do it. This is a letter that uh, caused some consternation in the British Academy. Uh, there was a, uh, um, the Queen visited the LSE, the London School of Economics, and just happened to ask casually to, I don't know which economist it was, you know, why didn't you just predict the crisis? You know, perfectly reasonable question. You are the experts. You have a science of economics. Well, what do you predict? <gasps> Consternation. When the British Academy, they convened a number of meetings with all the eminent uh, economists in, in Britain. And it's very interesting to read it. And here's what they said. This is a, it was a three-page letter to Her Majesty. And you can read there uh, itself. And it's all, you know, um, forecasting failure. We will, you know, get on the program with it. That's what they said. And they blamed, of course, as everybody was at the time, the financiers, these banksters. were not even bank banksters, these you know, evil people that took over major parts of the, uh, the financial sector. So they weren't, you know, the, bank, the banksters and the financiers were to blame, not the economists and their models. I mean, the, the, the level of intellectual arrogance is breathtaking within economics. And not having at least the decency to say, listen, you know what, we messed up. And all these models we have of efficient market hypothesis, stochastic equilibrium, and all the rest of it, we have to revise them in light of the economic crisis. Oh, not a bit of it. We should do it better. So the translation of what they said to me is this. We failed to predict the crisis. The bankers are to blame, but don't worry. We're confident we can get on top of this. We can develop models and so on. And there's nothing, there's no internal critique even the modicum of suggestion, we need to actually maybe rethink our, our economic models. And there's another missed opportunity to, to reform orthodox or mainstream economics. So, you know, that's my interpretation. Go and read that. It's online in the British Academy. You can read it yourself and, and make of it what you want. So, I think to fix economics, we need to return to its political economy roots. We never left it. Just because you remove political from economics does not mean it's any the less economic or political, or any the less ideological or value-based. And we have to remember, why is it that we live in a democracy? We enjoy, we like, in fact, it's a structural feature of democracy to have different ideas and the clash of ideas. 
So when it comes to organizing the policy, the politics, we want different ideas in a, in a democracy. So why is it when it comes to the economy, it's just one model? How's that happened? And this hasn't always been the case. Really is a recent uh, development, say in the last exactly 20 years, where we have the dominance of one economic uh, model. So it is about making values matter and making them explicit that essentially contemporary, orthodox, mainstream economics is capitalist economics. Now I've got a lot of problems with that from a normative value perspective, but at least I can respect, I know where you're coming from. Don't pretend it's neutral, impartial, objective. It isn't. If I had more time, I'd tell you how even science itself is not value neutral either. There's very few forms of human knowledge you can even think about that would not have values somewhere in it, but particularly economics because of its power in, in constructing uh, many parts of our public lives and the uh, infrastructure and so on that we, that we have. So my view is there is no value-free objective economics. It's a nonsense. All that happens is if you deny it, you're smuggling it in. It's a sleight of hand. So what we need is pluralism and debate, in the manner, for those of you who did the Dead White Man course, John Stuart Mill, what he called the collision theory of the truth, you get a debate between the different views and see which one wins out in terms of a, a public acceptance. So it's about democratizing economics. Part of it is about democratizing in the public sphere our debates about the economy. And in particular, we must ensure, even people like me, eloquent and, and that's what we're looking at, eloquent and all that we are, <laughs> Experts should be on tap, but not on top. Experts should be on tap, but not on top. They are to inform the debate, but economics, in this macroeconomic sense of what I'm largely talking about, the major principles of it are not so difficult that a decent, educated citizen could not get the, an understanding of how the economy could be and should be organised in terms of a public debate. <coughs> now, some of you see me... <coughs> Um, argued this before. This is my particular suggestion as an alternative economic model based upon my critique of the neoliberal, neoclassical model from a green perspective is to move from buildings, banks and boutiques. This is the dominant economic model that we had up until the crash. Buildings always have been property. Banks, the financialization or the growth of the financial sector in the economy to it growing to such an extent, say in the UK or the US economy as a proportion of overall economic activity and boutiques, because I need another B, <laughs> boutiques stand for debt-based consumerism. Essentially, buying stuff to impress people, buying stuff you don't need to impress people you don't care. That's uh, the essence of consumerism. And it's implicitly tied up issues of, of, of insecurity, uh, this consumption model. You have to go out there and consume to get the economy going. This model has failed, but yet it still is in existence. I do think we need a variety of ways of thinking, and particularly then this issue of the, uh, the organization of different <coughs> models and having a debate around different ideas of organizing the economy. So what do we place buildings and banks and boutiques with? Well, my three L's. Libraries, laundromats, and light rail. But in the context of a post-growth economy, and again, this is for the minority world. <coughs> I am not saying that this is the model that you extend to China and India and so on, although there are issues about how they achieve pro-poor, low-carbon development of those societies. And what I like about libraries, laundromats, and light rail is that they are forms of collective consumption. You know, we, they are forms, really libraries, I'm amazed that in our neoliberal world that libraries still exist, because they stand as an example of separating ownership from use. You go and borrow the DVD, the CD, the book, or in some places the painting and kids' toys. You use it, and you give it back. Usually at no or low cost. You don't have to buy it. So it's separating uh, use from ownership. It's also much more ecologically rational to have socialised consumption in laundromats and light rail. Light rail standing for public transport as opposed to private car ownership in particular. So I do think that these are the types of uh, policies and areas you need to look at for a, a post-growth, low-carbon economy, which also adds to human flourishing, which should be a major part of how we organize the economy, not economic growth, or even orthodox employment, 
but the issue of will orthodox economic growth or employment actually add to human flourishing? That's a very challenging issue. We haven't even begun to think about that issue politically. And I do think that, from a green point of view, it's also an indicative uh, planning system, but not in a Soviet old-style centralised planning. But how do we use our resources in a democratic, rational manner to meet the needs that we have? Because what we have at the minute is an economic distemper in the anarchy of a market-based system which pays no heed to next year. Never mind the ecological system. It's an issue of time in our orthodox economic understanding. And certainly in orthodox economic practice, it's about the next quarter. Profit shares have to increase. How can you plan on ecological cycles or on issues of agricultural cycles, which we need? I mean, you can live in a post-industrial society, but you can never live in a post-agricultural society. In fact, just as an aside, if you have any spare money, you want to invest it. Agricultural land is doing very well across these islands because we have a food crisis arising. How are we going to feed people? People are going to eat and so on. So it's getting back to the real fundamentals in a way. Re-embedding the economy and society, but it's ecologically literate in attending to how do we meet our needs in a way that doesn't wreck the planet or increase or exacerbate socioeconomic inequality or indeed diminish human flourishing. So there are my three criteria. If you can show me an economic system, an economic model, that is low carbon, ideally renewable energy based, not carbon based, because that's running out of uh, uh, steam, literally in terms of the planet's ability to absorb CO2. So it has to be low carbon. Does it actually reduce socioeconomic inequality, which has grown in our society in the last 30 years? That was a part of the impetus behind the Occupy movement, you know, the 1%, 99%. I mean, our societies have grown increasingly unequal. And least to be said that this is a politics of envy, or you're just you know, promoting on a left-wing, grad grind politics of envy about inequality. We have the statistical, we have the survey, we have the empirical evidence that the more unequal a society is, the less well it does on a whole range of indicators. Female pregnancy, so, uh, senses of social solidarity, uh, personal safety. And I'm taking this from a very influential book a few years ago called The Spirit Level. Some of you may have heard of The Spirit Level. The subtitle is, Why Do More Equal Societies Always Always Do Better? So inequality is a problem socially. What, where do we hear about the politics of inequality in our society? We're much more comfortable in the media, in politicians, speak, in the political class, to talk about the poor, poverty, marginalisation. Well, my argument is... Poverty, the poor, and marginalisation are caused by inequality. If you want to deal with poverty, you've got to deal with inequality, but no one wants to talk about that. It's too left-wing, too radical. Because you're challenging the existing distribution of power in, in society. We have the evidence, much like we have the scientific evidence, that's telling us, like in that image of the ship going over the edge, and I think, and I would ask Graham to correct me, I think it's a Chinese saying, if you keep going the way you're going, but guess what? You're going to go to where you're headed. And where we're headed is not very good. What's amazing and happening in America now, talk about this fiscal cliff that the society is in in America. What well, the ecological <coughs> cliff that we're already starting to go over. So the issue is <coughs> low carbon, challenges and reduces socioeconomic inequality. And the last one is the forms of economic development or models that actually increase human flourishing rather than decrease it. Because here's the thing. For the last 30 years, we have had a social recession. Certainly in the UK, for which I have most knowledge of the statistics. It's sometimes called the crocodile graph. We've had economic growth going up. Yeah, there was a dip in 74 with the oil price shock, and then 79, and then Black Wednesday later on the 80s, and now we're currently in another dip. But more or less, the economy has increased in terms of measurements by GDP. Going along here are reported levels of life satisfaction. In other words, we've got all this frantic activity of liberalisation of finance, of our energy markets, of globalisation, of consumption, of iPhones and all the rest of it, and we're no more or better off than we were 30 years ago. And yet we don't really hear this issue, this crocodile graph, the gap between all this frantic economic activity which is causing us to be locked into carbon, causing climate change, 
causing us to live in more unequal societies, causing all these other problems, and yet it's not making us any better. Now, what does an economy look like that not only has some knowledge of, even I settle for the second law of thermodynamics, that you can create matter and energy, uh, just get transformed one thing to another. There's some basic embedding of our economic system in the physical realities of the world. And the second one, imagine an economy designed that was meant to increase human flourishing and not just uh, economic growth. So here endeth the secular sermon, children.